Hi, I'm Kalila Enriquez and welcome to this Business Access TV special. Today we're talking with one of the most well-known and respected names in business, a man who's about to take his company to the next level and who's given many years of service not only to his company and the private sector, but also to his country. He was recently inducted into the Private Sector Organization of Jamaica, the PSOJ's Hall of Fame. Of course, I'm talking about Earl Jarrett, General Manager of Jamaica National Building Society. Welcome, Mr. Jarrett. Thank you. Thank you for having me on your program. Well, congratulations on being inducted into the PSOJ Hall of Fame. Thank you very much. It's a really important honor. I take it very seriously and I'm humbled and thank the PSOJ for that great uh, recognition. What went through your mind when you first heard that you were receiving that honor? Um, I was, I was a, it was a little incredulous. I initially said, um, no, not me, uh, but eventually uh, I accepted the, 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 the honor. And um, ever since it has been really good, it's been good to hear from my peers and colleagues who have had nice things to say. I'm, I'm glad I'm alive and hearing it. You know? <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Praise people while they're here with us to, to receive the praise. Let's start at the beginning of your career in banking. Were you always drawn to this type of career? Well, I've always been in finance and accounting. I actually did my uh, first degree and my master's degree in, in accounting, and I'm a chartered accountant, and I spent many years in my early career in the firm uh, KPMG. In those days, it was called Pete Marwick. So I've always been around numbers and, and financial organizations. Some people wonder what you must have been like as a schoolboy growing up. What were you like? I was a, a pretty good student. I, 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 was, I was not in the, among those who gave trouble. I was, I was um, pretty reserved, pretty quiet in some instances, um, pretty focused, uh, listened carefully. So no, no troublemaker at school? No, not really. Not that, not that I didn't get, get a couple of um, demerits in high school and you know, did experience one or two canings from time to time, but, but not, nothing, nothing. I can't nothing. imagine Earl Jarrett getting caned, <laughs> but that's the man now, not the boy there. <laughs> so you joined JNBS 18 years ago. Yes. You've been general manager there for 16 years, 1999, if I'm not that's mistaken. Correct. You're correct. Uh, you came to the company at a time when the financial sector was reeling, the, the turmoil of the 1990s, FinSAC and all that. What was it like coming to a company and having to, to deal with all that had just happened and make that transition at Jamaica National? Well, at the time I joined, um, you know, the economy was just about adjusting its way out. There was, there was um, you know, the FinSAC experience was still there. People were, you know, FinSAC was actually in some instances, still trying to solve the issues for some of the banks. It held a number of assets that were formerly, that was formerly held in the bank. Um, I, on the other side, in the commercial sector, I was with uh, Geddes Grant and Neela Massey Pryor, so I saw on the other side the impact of the financial sector crisis, the difficulties that we had with high inflation rates, high mm -hmm. interest rates, the challenges for banks. Going into Jamaica National, um, I should note that Jamaica National uh, was was hardly affected by the financial sector crisis. And that, that came about because of the fairly conservative way in which Jamaica National has always been run, uh, very careful and steady with a, with a rock solid board of directors. The other important thing was that the world was changing too. Mm -hmm. uh, information technology was about to, to change our lives um, permanently dramatically. and dramatically. And so within Jane, one of the first things that, um, that we sought to do was to, was to embrace that change. Uh, embrace that change by putting in place new systems. Uh, so one of my first responsibilities was to put in a new banking system. And by so doing, we were able to change the way in which the building society operated. Prior to then, each branch of the building society was almost a mini building society as the whole system was de decentralized. Technology enabled us now to centralize those operations, creating greater levels of efficiencies and enabling us to roll out new products and services on a much faster basis. Right. It also enabled us to change the way the branch was configured. In other words, the branches used to have their own little accounting departments and so on. You're able to get to, to, to change that and turn those branches into points of customer contact ex exclusively. That implementation was probably one of Jamaica's most successful implementation of IT in a big organization at any time. And the reasons for that was simply that we, 
we took a decision that we're going to spend a significant amount of time doing the planning, doing the preparation up front, fighting against the pressures from the people who are selling the software to implement it quickly. So we took 18 months to do it and do it carefully, implement it carefully, had an entirely rock solid governance process around the implementation process with a steering committee, various streams of leadership to, to implement the project and it worked. Back then the exchange rate was what in the 40s you tell me? Yes. it, it, it 40 it, something it, to it, one it, and it's yes. now almost at 120 20, so yes, yes. what impact has this dramatic uh, depreciation had on your business? Well for our organization we are primarily a we're a Jamaican organization we take Jamaican mainly Jamaican deposits. We do have uh, a fair amount of foreign currency deposits. We do do remittances. And we do match our foreign currency deposits, which are our liabilities with, with foreign currency assets. And so we carefully manage our exposures to foreign exchange. And um, from our point of view, we have really not had a significant negative impact. But for your customers it would have a, a huge impact. Well, I would prefer to, to couch the conversation to the, to, um, in a manner that says that the, 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 the change in the exchange rates have forced our country to become far more efficient globally mm. and that it has helped to sort to, to, to balance our, our you know, um, foreign currency accounts or current accounts overseas because now we we import somewhat less um, than we did in the past and so there's a narrowing of the gap between our exports and our imports but from the consumer's point of view from the person on the street it, it does mean that where we are purchasing foreign based items that the cost of those items would have increased in the household basket. And so many of our Jamaicans uh, may and sh will, would have experienced increased prices. However, when you play in the global open markets, you, 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 you win and you lose. So we have also must match that with the fact that um, oil prices have reduced quite significantly. Recently, and so, yes, and after, so after being very after, high after being very for high quite for some time. Years, but but it, it has helped to reduce the levels of inflation. What we have been seeing in recent times with the growth in the business outsourcing um, and the opportunities here in Jamaica is part the result of that increased competitiveness as the currency rate has, has depreciated uh, to match um, the inflation rates in our near here against our near Australian partners. Do, do, you, see the, the do you see mm. the rate falling much further than where it is now? Well, you see, my own view, and I don't want to be predictive about, about uh, exchange rates, but the exchange rate is really a function of what we do here. And so if we are able to increase our productivity, increase our competitiveness, be more attractive to foreign investors and have our exports become more attractive, then we begin to, 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 to fight against this exchange rate, which is really if we were to look at an analogy with us as human beings, that exchange rate is really one of our, our indicators of our health. Just as my, if, my, if my blood pressure starts going up, it's a, it's a measure of something that's going on in 120 me. 120 doesn't know? sound too healthy though. <laughs> <laughs> but therefore it means that one needs to do what is necessary yes. to, to, to ensure that one stays healthy. When we come back on this Business Access TV special, Earl Jarrett talks about threats to the remittance industry. Welcome back to this Business Access TV special with General Manager of Jamaica National Building Society and 2015 PSOJ Hall of Fame inductee, Earl Jarrett. Let's talk a bit more about the remittance industry because you started addressing it already. It represents a significant portion of our GDP, of our yes. economy. Yes. And you spoke to some of the challenges, financing of terrorism that banks fear, um, and some of the other ones, lottery scamming and so on. How has this affected your industry and what are we going to do about it now that banks are, many banks are unwilling to finance remittance companies? Well, the situation is, is, is this. I mean, first of all, just to give you a background to, to remittances and, and the Jamaican remittance experience. 
Uh, Jamaica, for many years, have seen the migration of our people. Our people have been leaving here from the 19, 1916s, going to the United States, signing the book at Ellis Island. That, um, that's in the United States. We had Jamaicans who left here in the uh, you know, 1940s. 1948 was a, was a significant year where people went to the UK. You would have heard the stories about HMS Windrush and those Jamaicans who went to the UK yes. to support the reconstruction of the UK after the wars. You have had Jamaicans who went off to Canada in the 19, uh, well, in the 1970s and the United States again in the 1960s and 70s. It's estimated that there are roughly 3 million Jamaicans who live outside of Jamaica. The Jamaican family and the Jamaican experience is, is, is a truly global one, where parts of the family is here and part is somewhere else, and that continues to be the case. They say the diaspora is bigger than the population Could, at home. It, 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 that's, that's, the, that's the estimate. But what it therefore means is, like in any household, funds move between rooms. Right. You know, they, you know, one has mortgage to pay and one has school fees to pay. Funds move between rooms. Remittance is simply that, 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 that device that connects the family financially. What's happening is that the remittances are now being uh, caught up in a wider issue of anti-money laundering and the, and the control of, of illicit movement of funds around the world. And we have been and the remittance companies have all responded to that by putting in place systems of, to monitor systems, to report on transactions that are deemed suspicious, to be able to identify where um, funds are not good, clean funds. And I must say that based on research done been through many institutions, um, you know, in the Inter-American Dialogue in Washington as a, uh, a unit that monitors remittances, the proportion of, of tainted remittances that move through remittance companies, at least to Jamaica, is relatively small compared to the total. So. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, banks in the developed countries, the United States, the UK, have been experiencing significant fines for transactions where they have failed to monitor or failed to report. Many of these transactions not dealing with normal family remittances, but significant large sums of monies that pass around the world which did not receive the appropriate scrutiny. Right. And these banks have been fined significantly. And in response to those fines, many of the banks have, have decided that they want to reduce the risk. And therefore, they are not willing to provide banking services, not, not even financing, just basic banking services to entities that perform the service of remittances. Can you blame them for that, though? Well. Um, what I, what I would say is that the, the, these banks need to really operate on a far more risk assessed basis. In other words, rather than throwing out the baby and its bath water, the, the banks need to look carefully at the risks, monitor those entities um, a lot more. And really, what's the real issue is that the banks need to also speak to the governments in some of the countries where they operate to to, 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 and to demonstrate on a technical level that they have in place good systems to ensure that the business of remittance remains safe. And so what the banks are doing is are simply running from the problem and saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to avoid these fines, so I'm not going to touch these, these entities. But I should say it's not all banks because um, there are still some banks that are moving on a fairly good technical basis and doing the assessment and continue to provide the service. They're but becoming fewer and fewer. Fewer and fewer and fewer. And, and um, you know, in, in recent years, recent months, we have had the experience in, in at least one country where there's no bank that's providing any service to any remittance outfit at all. What about the role of international organizations like the World Bank and the IMF who yes. have a, a, an obligation? The World Bank has a, an anti-poverty role and remittances serve a large population of poor people. You are absolutely right. It, it, it's not just a matter of, of um, satisfying the needs of poor people. If we accept the, the reality that we are in a global space and that there is no nation state that can will adequately provide all of the resources and skills that it needs, then one can expect that people will be moving across borders to provide services. There has been significant work on this. I, I recall the Ramphal Commission, which was chaired by our former Prime Minister, 
Honorable P.J. Patterson, which was looking specifically at this issue of global migration and the necessary services to support that. Um, so the multilateral partners around the world, or the, 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 the multilateral agencies, the World Bank, the, um, the IMF itself, the United Nations, I think they all recognize the importance of providing this pathway. Globally, it's around $400 billion that goes around the world as remittances, which is a large number, but not a very large number, but a large number, and it affects so many lives, and it is far more than development aid itself. Yes. And I think they have recognized that. But at the same time, the compelling desire to have a safe world, safe from um, criminal activities and persons who are seeking to proliferate nuclear um, armaments and um, you know, trafficking of persons. Uh, we have a world that's so today filled with criminal activities that one needs to keep it safe. So there has to be a balance between the two. But that said, I believe those agencies are working and trying to think through solutions. And we are trying to engage with those agencies as well to try to find meaningful solutions. And Jamaica does have an opportunity through its membership in the United Nations, its, its participation and membership in these other agencies to share the views. And, and, and I know as a fact that our government is expressing those concerns about what's happening in what I would say the, 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 the um, third world or undeveloped world that remittances represents an important um, stream of income for countries that we should not allow to, to, to disappear. In the case of Jamaica, as I said, it's the, 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 the straight cash remittance is around 17% of our GDP. Massive. And if you were to remove that from Jamaica, then Jamaica would certainly have a significant problem. Yes. So, so it is not something that our government, both, it's, 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 it's the, both the, the, the full government, uh, including the opposition, uh, are concerned about and are articulating um, for there to be some meaningful solution to the problem. When we come back, Earl Jarrett tells us how the Jamaica National Building Society is dealing with the transition into a commercial bank. Welcome back to this Business Access TV special with General Manager of Jamaica National Building Society and 2015 PSOJ Hall of Fame inductee Earl Jarrett. Let's talk some more about the wider business because yes. Jamaica National is about to make this big transition and become a bank. It took you seven years to finally get the license. Yes. How soon will we be seeing JN Bank? Well, as you, as you would have known, we, 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 we have received a nod of approval um, with, with some steps to go through. First of all, I should remind you that Jamaica National Building Society is a mutual organization. What's a mutual organization? It's an organization that is owned by its customers. So each customer of Jamaica National, whether you're a borrower or a saver, is actually an owner of the Jamaica National Business Society Group. Each member has one vote, regardless of the amount of funds you have within the organization. So it's a very democratic organization. It therefore meant that as we reconfigured Jamaica National, we had to, we had to find a new way of retaining this special type of ownership structure. And so what we have done is that we will be converting the building society itself into a bank, but at the same time reconstructing our entire group that we will have at least three holding companies within the group. One holding company which will own our financial businesses, which will be the converted JN Bank, as well as our life insurance company, our general insurance company, our remittance company, and so on and another group that will own our non-financial businesses like our MCS Limited, which is our technology company, MCIS, the Motor Vehicle Fleet Management Company, our Jamaica Automobile Association, or Total Credit Services. So we'll have these two groups. And then at the top of that, you'll have the ownership of the organization in something called our holding company, mutual holding company, which will be an entity which will be owned by the customers of the bank. So within this new structure, um, Jane will now advance with Jane, the building society, being Jane, the bank, under the financial holding company. And so what you have is a bank which is owned by its customers. 
And how long do you expect that to take? This will probably take us to about the first quarter of next year. Okay, so it's pretty soon. It's, it's pretty soon. I mean, if I give myself slippages, maybe we might sneak over into the second quarter, but but in the first quarter. But it's an exciting prospect for many of our members and customers today by virtue of the fact that Jane was unable to provide much of the banking services that they need, they were almost obliged to have an account somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And so what will happen when we open, this, open the doors is that we now create a place where they can complete their financial life in one organization. Um, if you wish, there'll be fidelity. Mm. <laughs> when you do make that mm. transition, yes. you will be the third largest bank in Jamaica behind NCB and Scotia. A good... That's list. impressive. Yes, yes. It, 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 it is, but you know, those are two very large banks. Yes, we will, we will it, fall in there. Um, and that's what the numbers say. But at the end of the day, it's about the customer and the members. So that large number is good because the, 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 the size is good to run an organization today. As I mentioned today, to you today, you have to have all these skills and talents to, to just stay within the scope of the law and to deliver the services and so on. Yes, but at the same time mm. as well, you are transitioning into a different sphere of competition. You're no longer competing with the other building societies. You're playing with the big boys now, Indeed. two companies that yes. dominate the market, yes. have 75% of the market. Yes. Do you have any concerns about moving into that sphere? Well, one has to be mindful. One has to be alert to the environment within which you're operating. But the truth is that you know, Jane, over these last number of years, uh, has grown itself. And, and with the limited um, range of products that we have to offer, it has enabled us to deliver ourselves at this position in the race. Um, we are fairly optimistic that, that our uh, delivery and the products that we intend to offer will, will keep our customers connected to us. We fully understand that in the world that we operate, you have many moving parts at the same time. So as we move, our competitors are going to be moving and, and they, they won't necessarily be very kind to us to mm. help us along the way. <laughs> but we think that the nature of our organization, the fact that we are so deeply rooted and embedded in the Jamaican spirit itself, we have been born and bred and grown out of that Jamaican environment. Um, we believe that our our strength and commitment to the people of Jamaica to finding meaningful solutions. Jamaica National has demonstrated in, its, in the past its willingness to, to venture where others would not go to support the people of Jamaica, whether that is through our small business lending firm where we decided that we would have established an entity to support small and micro businesses that needed capital that they couldn't get anywhere else, whether it was our desire to Jamaicanize the remittance business to the extent that today we are the largest remittance company within the entire Caribbean out of Jamaica. Or the fact that we have recognized the need for many of our Jamaicans overseas to, 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 to receive deliberate targeted services to their needs. These are the things that comes from an organization that is so deeply rooted in the outcomes and in the people of Jamaica. And so I am confident um, that you know, we keep our eyes focused on where it should be focused, on the outcome of our people. Our people are facing quite a bit of challenges right now. We're under an IMF program. Yes. The last year is about to you know, come upon us. Yes. Uh, what's your take on the state of the Jamaican economy right now? First of all, we sh we sh I should set the context that got us to where we are. And uh, you know, um, there's been a very important study which was done by the, the um, Caribbean Policy Research Institute, Capri, and the Caribbean Development Bank, which looked at the development of the Jamaican debt. And, you know, the Jamaican debt is actually heavily um, influenced by climate change, which many of us don't recognize. The fact that Jamaica and many Caribbean islands experience significant hurricanes and earthquakes, and which results in significant infrastructure damage, which mm -hmm. has resulted in, in nation states like Jamaica stepping into their uh, fiscal space to repair. We have also been we had the sad experience of the 1980s where a number of um, entities which were not in central government itself, but um, you know, some in some instances state agencies and in some instances private sector entities. And that's what really drove the debt to GDP ratio to the heights that we found it. 
With that said, some will argue that you know, our country should have put in mitigating policies and controls to make it happen, but the reality is that this is what caused it. Over the past few years, and particularly um, in more recent times under the IMF program, we have been able to bring down that debt to GDP. I believe it's somewhere around 125, 126% now. Partly contributed by the efforts of the people of Jamaica through the debt exchange, where they gave up some of their yes. interest income to support it. So really, the people of Jamaica have come together in, a, in an act of great national sacrifice to improve the macroeconomic numbers. And, and we are seeing that happening. Are we on the right track? It, that, that, you know, you ask some very difficult questions. It, we are on the right track to get the numbers right. Um, we, we need to tune our process to ensure that we grow and grow to keep, uh, to maintain and retain jobs, to be attractive to local and international people and investors. And I believe that we have done a, a fair job of the uh, containment and the austerity um, to date. And I think that we, 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 we have been seeing um, some investment flows coming in. The job really is now about thinking through Jamaica 2.0 and what is going ah, to be the construct like for that, that Jamaica. Jamaica um, 2.0. You, you know, whether it's, I mean, we have said lightly that it's going to be a services-oriented society. We need to think through what does that mean? We need to think about some of the laws that we have on the books which were designed around the old commodity and plantation economy and see how we can now shape those laws to support an economy where you're dealing with services, where people will be coming and going. Um, we, it, could in, it could mean having to have a look at our immigration rules and laws here in Jamaica. It could mean having another look at, at um, many of the laws that support energy and our, and our utility companies here. So there are a number of old rules in Jamaica which were designed around a different type of economy from yes. the one that's emerging. Are you optimistic about I, the future? I have lived my entire life in Jamaica. I have lived through the 70s and the 80s. I have seen the impact of the, of, of, of the economy. Um, it's, I remember as a young child listening to the Prime Minister of the days, speaking about tightening our belts further. I have seen it. I understand the frustration. It, it worries me. However, I do believe that we have the ingredients in the nature of our people, in the situation of our island, in the fact that we continue to be creative. I believe that our people will find those solutions if we continue along a path of, of um, deliberate, evidence-based decision-making. Um, I believe and I'm optimistic in the future. Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Jarrett. Thank you very much. <laughs> The Thank ingredients you. for Jamaica 2.0. We have it, he says. On an optimistic note, Earl Jarrett, PSOJ Hall of Famer, the General Manager of Jamaica National Building Society, soon to be Jamaica National Bank. That's it for this Business Access TV special. I'm Kalila Enriquez. Thanks for watching.